Oh, good morning, Mr. Steele. Good morning, Miss Potter. How are you? Well, I'm fine, and this is a beautiful morning on Signal Mountain in Tennessee. Your story of the spooky thing was so good. Did you make up that story about old Leach? Uh, yes. I made up that story about old Leach. I'm uh, soaked in uh, uh, southern folklore. I feel like I've read so much, and uh, uh, I feel like I can make up one of my own. And so I did in the spooky thing. In fact, I made up three in there, two anyway, and threw them in, and uh, these are from my experience and my reading of folklore and my uh, involvement with it over the past two, three decades. Um, now, well, what made the well wheel turn in that? Uh, do you remember the... Um... Yes, I remember the well wheel turn. I, I, I suppose you could call it just ghosty things, or else you could just uh, let it go at that. Now, then you said in that same book you had two, another one you made up, and then was that story about... Is it Gist and Merriweather or Gist well, and Well, Gist and Merriweather are the heroes. Yes. And uh, I made up one about J. Bud, who, uh, as I remember, had no head. A man with a little scrawny neck, just a little piece of neck bone coming down the chimney and scanning this man. That's the one. That's the one you made up. <laughs> uh, well, now, how do you come by your names, like names like uh, J. Bird and, and just Gist, you said? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. it is. Not just yes, Gist. Yes, there's a name that floats all through the South here, and uh, Meriwether is one of those names down here, too. And uh, I pick up Southern names always. I take them off of the court rolls, uh, out of old histories, any way I can find them. If they sound right to me for the book I'm writing, then I use them. And I want you to know that it's hard to get the right name. <laughs> well, they always seem to fit so well, that's why... Uh, well, that's from hard <laughs> plotting and playing for days and days and days. <laughs> now, uh, all through your books, uh, particularly the books on folklore, we find words that I suppose are made up, such things as in this book about um, spooky thing, uh, a rumbobolotish appetite. Am I saying it right? R-U-M-B-O-B-O-L-O-T-I-S-H? Mm. Well, I don't know how to pronounce that either. Isn't that horrible? <laughs> <laughs> I can make these up and throw them in, and y'all can pronounce them any way you want to. Discombobulate is always one of those words that somebody always brings up and says, did you make this up? And I suggest, why not? Can't you make up things like this? After all, it was Lee and everybody else did these sort of things. Why can I fall in his shadow? Not that I'm as great as Edward Lear, but uh, why not make up things any way you can? And... It also fits in with the old pioneers of the South and the Southwest, of the old Southwest, as you want to call it, South and West of the old, of the 13th original colonies. Uh, they always made up words in telling their stories, and if they couldn't find, come on a word they wanted, they would make up one and throw it in. And I think in the hunting and fishing stories and the tall tales they told, you need some wild words in there. Mm -hmm. I think it adds to it, frankly, and I always try to throw in one or two. You can overdo it now, yeah. but I try to hold it down and just throw in some that's a little flavor. It certainly does add to it. And, well, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Now, the boys and girls like the hidden jokes in uh, the spooky thing when he was told that six spoons of some remedy, uh, to take uh, six spoons of some remedy and Meriwether doesn't think he can swallow the six spoons. <laughs> 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 oh, or when they ran their hands uh, on their hands to save their feet for running later. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you all appreciate this humor because I think it's funny. Now, I don't know whether anybody else does or not. I, I, I really enjoy writing tall tales and I often go back. These are the only books of mine that I write that I go back and reread. I don't like to reread my other books, but I like to reread my uh, tall tales. And I often sit down and just laugh and laugh and laugh. <laughs> <laughs> we read them. <laughs> well, uh, we laugh and laugh when we read them. Now, did you ever see a scary thing? Oh, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. This is uh, based on an old folk tale, you know, in which there was a thing that set up in a tree. Oh. It was fiery, and mm -hmm. it never was described. And, of course, I never described it in this book, you realize. Yes. Did you make up the story by Davy Crockett's earthquake? Yes. Mm -hmm. But, of course, in the year 1811, there wasn't uh, an earthquake, and there was a, uh, a comic in the sky. But I just put David in contact with it. Now, uh, do you think that um, David really told big whoppers like these? Well, David Crockett came from Tennessee, and Tennessee has a, a reputation of, uh, in, in back in the pioneer days, of uh, the men here telling the stories, uh, a lot of judges go out on the circuit court, they like to tell stories, they meet people that have been hunting and fishing, and they tell stories to the judges, the judges pass them on, and after all, Mark Twain picked up some of his best stories from down here in the southwest and in Tennessee, exactly, and uh, uh, this is part of our tradition, we're used to telling stories, so we tell them, and I think so, yes, Crockett told them. 
we like the Daniel Boone story. Uh, Daniel Boone's echo, you mean? That's right. Uh-huh. Because uh, things happen, funny things happen so fast. <laughs> Why didn't he wear a coonskin hat, cap? Uh, didn't Daniel Boone supposed to be wearing coonskin hat? Well, he's supposed to, but that's not right. Uh, historically, he wore an old black hat, and uh, coonskin caps, very few of the pioneers wore coonskin caps. They were too hot in the first place, and they didn't bother with messing with them to fix them. When they could get a good felt hat of, of buffalo hide or hair or whatever it was, they made those hats out of them. And uh, the coonskin caps came in about the War of 1812, really and truly. And uh, later uh, historians and uh, later people pushed them back to Daniel Boone's day. But this is not right historically now. Oh, good. So yeah. Daniel Boone always wore an old black hat, and this historical fact, and so I use it historical fact, even though I'm writing a tall tale, Daniel Boone wears a black hat, and this is what he wore. I would not give him a wrong thing. Now, I may make up a lot of wild tales about it, and it didn't happen, but I would give him always the clothes he wore and the rifle he had, and that sort of thing. That's good. Uh, let me tell you, speaking of Daniel Boone's echo, I just got back from talking in Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, a few days ago, and some boys put that little poem I had in Daniel Boone's echo to music. They did it themselves, made up the whole music, and they sang it for me while I was up there, and it was delightful. That was a, a, a good little poem. Now, you made that poem up, didn't yes, you? Yes, that's that? right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In that, uh, story of Daniel Boone's echo, was there a real, uh, Aaron Adamsale? No, no, all, all my people are made up just for the moment. Mm-hmm. You wrote another book about Danny Boone, didn't you? But, uh, the story of Danny Boone, yes. that's right. It was Fish and Line Virus. That's probably my best mm-hmm. seller in truth of all my many books. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a good uh, <laughs> good story of Danny Boone, too. I mean, it's, uh, the facts are there, and yet it's written interestingly enough so that we read right along and mm-hmm. I really enjoy it. Well, they have, we've asked about another word, but I think maybe you've more or less answered it. It was in uh, Danny Boone's echo story, uh, the word slantendicular. Oh, in well. a slantendicular fashion, but you say that's one of those words you made. That, that's, that's, well, uh, you, you never know what the pun is in you. I don't know whether I made it up or not. Mm-hmm. I've seen it written in, uh, stories from the past. Mm-hmm. And, uh, pun is this, this old Southwest humor, which, uh, 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 spawned Mark Twain, this old Southwest humor. They have slantendicular and words like that in there. Mm-hmm. I always, I don't, I don't always make up all these words. I just find them and use them, you know. Mm-hmm. But sometimes I add a few syllables to them or change them around mm-hmm. to suit me. They're very colorful. We've got a couple of more in this uh, line. No name, man of the mountain. That's probably my best tall tale book. I think uh, it's, it's, it's terrific. It's got a little heart throb in there too, you know. <laughs> uh, yes, it certainly has. I don't want to give away the uh, uh, the joke at the end, uh, Please but don't. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, we did wonder: uh, Did you start with the name uh, and go back, uh, or did you? Uh, Find the name for him toward the end of the story. Do you remember? No, I had to do something about the Indian and his name, and this came up in, in the process. Mm-hmm. I mean, I started out with this general idea that I wanted, but I didn't know what I was going to do at the end. And this is what one. This is why you should leap before you look, because if you wait till you look on stories like this, you may never get started writing it. So I got started writing it while I felt it, mm-hmm. and I, all the while I was writing it, I was worrying about the Indian. <laughs> that was in my mind. How am I going to do this and make it terrific? Mm-hmm. And this. It's one of those things that came up. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was a very fortuitous fun. thing to <laughs> come up. Sometimes it doesn't, you know. Yeah. I've done this before and I've had a good ending and have to struggle and struggle and struggle to get something mm-hmm. and be caught right there, have the whole book written except the last two chapters and never have the right ending. That I know it's the right ending mm-hmm. for me now. And so uh, this just worked out beautifully. Mm-hmm. Well, no, it's certainly it's wonderful. Oh, it's, it's a wonderful ending. Um, I don't mind bragging on my good books. <laughs> well, I don't think you have many that aren't good that, uh, that we've well, read. Nice, yes, um, now, you have written quite a few books about frontier life, like Perilous Road and Far Frontier, uh, Winter Danger. There's a great deal in these about how people really lived and real events. Now, how do you get these facts? Well, I spent the last 20, 25 years doing nothing but researching uh, about the uh, pioneer period down in my area right here, Kentucky, Tennessee, the, the back country of Virginia, North Carolina. And I've read old histories, and I've read diaries, and I've read journals and accounts that people wrote of those days, and I've studied old maps, and I've gone out myself on various trails. I've looked up where forts were in person and to try to find the remains of it and whatnot, and I feel like that I'm a, well, I mean, I, I, this is my feel, and since I have old uh, boxes and boxes of notes on this, if I want to know about a fort, I go and look in my notes. If I want to know about certain types of cows they had then, or trees or whatever, I go and look at my notes, so that I've done all this for background material for my books. 
So it, uh, I think you need this. You know, they said a writer should never write about what he does not know about. He should write about what he does know. And I feel like I know the pioneer period, and the Indians and pioneers then, and this is the reason I write most of my books of that period. It's a wonderful way to get history. I don't stick to much history. It's just trying to give it the way the little common man lived yes. in those days, which, of course, is the history, you realize. The, the, the great leaders didn't always make the history. It's the common man that's in there making the history just as much as George Washington or John Sevier or whatever, you know. Well, this is the important thing, and this is the thing we're interested in, uh, to know how people uh, lived, and we get so much of this from your books. In The Perilous Road, did that story um, take place near the Signal Mountain where you lived here? Yes, about 10 miles from my very home here was that raid, that what they call the Wheeler's Raid, in which he uh, uh, brought his cavalry in and uh, destroyed a, uh, a federal, he, Wheeler was a southern man, and uh, he destroyed a federal uh, unit of, uh, of uh, wagons that were loaded with ammunition and food. They were trying to get from uh, Sequatchie Valley, which is a good old Indian <coughs> Cherokee name, Sequatchie meaning green possum, but <laughs> they were trying to get from Sequatchie Valley over Signal Mountain into the valley where Chattanooga is on the opposite side. And Wheeler happened to hear about this uh, wagon train, and he raided it and destroyed every bit of it. And wagons all up and down the whole side, the western side of Signal Mountain, were ablaze and blowing up and whatnot. So I started out with that, and I thought, how can I make a story around Wheeler's raid? Because it's very good, very dramatic very sudden, and there was nothing like it in the whole Civil War that I could find, just quite like that. And so I started out from that and got my boy and uh, so forth and got him involved with Wheeler's Ray, and that was it. Uh -huh. But you know, uh, let me add a little bit something further. Some boy asked me the other day, did, did all that fighting take place on the mountain between mountain families? And it really did. I based my whole book, The Paris Road, on things that happened back here, not only on Signal Mountain, but all back in the Cumberland Mountains. And this is some of the nastiest, dirtiest warfare in the Civil War. It wasn't on the battlefield. It was back here in the mountains where neighbor fought neighbor, where uh, a little community would fight another community. They'd get mad at each other and do this sort of thing and prey on each other and rob them and steal them and burn them. And this was the nasty part of the Civil War. And all this stuff I used in there about... Mountain family against mountain family really took place back here. This this is it, and this is what I think is, is the shameful part of it. Not not on the battlefield. Now, on the battlefield, you suspect a little gunshot and whatnot and whatnot, and that's fine. But back here, it was nasty and sly and dirty, always. It's the tragedy of war. That's uh, it. This uh, got caught. These are, these are the people that really got caught in it, not the ones on the battlefield, but these people back in here. In the book, The Far Frontier, do you know where the idea for that came from? Well, you know, uh, all down across the South, we have an awful lot of good flora and fauna. And early, people like Audie Bond and Alexander Wilson and uh, Nisho and a bunch of naturalists came down our way to uh, uh, study our flora and fauna. You know, the birds and the plants and the beasts and the whatnot and whatnot we have here. And uh, I just thought, well, one of it is if you could have, if you could write a book around a naturalist, uh, for example, who came down here. And so I made up Mr. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, he's sort of a combination of all you barn, all of them, uh, all these naturalists. And uh, I had him come down here. And, of course, if he came down, he had to have a boy to go along and help him uh, collect birds and collect plants and collect things. So that, that, that's the way that got started. Thistle Tree is certainly an interesting character because he starts out to be someone you think you're not going to like and right. then he becomes such an admirable I character. Think he's very nice. I liked him very much. I didn't think I was going to like him much either to start <laughs> with, but he developed a lot of personality, which I didn't know he was going to have to start with. Uh, is there really an old fort? That's, That's right, and it's over there. I've been over there several times, and uh, uh, they're going to make a, a state park out of it now. Things like that in my books, I always use true things. If I bring them into a valley, and I named the valley, then you can depend on it. I've seen that valley, or I'm, I've seen the maps about it, and I know it's there's mountains on each side or a spring here or whatever. And so when I brought in the old fort, that really was an old fort, and I described it as I have seen it. Now, was there an Indian chief called Dragon Canoe? There was an Indian chief called Dragon Canoe who almost upset the whites down here in the south one time. He really was a Cherokee, but at that time they had broken away from the Cherokee Nation, and they called themselves Chickamaugas because they lived on a Chickamauga Creek, and they took the name Chickamauga. But he was, uh, 
he hated white people, and he wanted to go back to the past where the Indians were Indians. Of course, he waited too late, and I think he fully realized that, but he just made it rough with Indians in the last few years of uh, while the Cherokees were still undomesticated, more or less, you can mm. say. The story of Leif Erickson uh, is different from most of your stories, which are about Kentucky and Tennessee. How did you happen to write this story? Well, you realize authors have many possibilities here. Editors will write them and say, do you want to write a book about uh, the Green Mountain Boys? Or do you want to write a book about the Oregon Trail? Would you like to do a book for us about Leif Erickson? So they sent me a list of three books they would like to have me do if I would. And, uh, of course, I could turn them all three down and said, no, I'll not do a book for you. But Leif Erickson appealed to me because the Vikings were rough and fierce like the pioneers that I've been writing about. They didn't use long rifles, but they used swords and spears. And I mean, that was a fierce, fierce age of Vikings. And I thought I would really love to write about Lee Erickson. And so I took it up as a challenge and spent a lot of time researching. And I had my wife help me because she got involved and uh, got intrigued with Leaf and Greenland and Newfoundland and whatnot. And uh, we had great fun there for a while researching and writing about Leaf. It is quite different from other tales. The places you speak about were all in the what, New England area. And well, you see, when I wrote this, they hadn't they hadn't found this uh, 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 place that uh, the meadow, whatever it was, up in Newfoundland that that a man discovered two three years ago, that that a Viking settlement that dates of Leif Erikson's time. At that time, they hadn't, and everybody was debating where Leif actually landed, whether it was down in Cape Cod, down in that far south, or whether it was up in Newfoundland and whatnot. So I just made mine fairly general, but more or less at, at Newfoundland, along in there, as I remember. Yes. But I try to leave it general. You had certain things like grapes growing, and you had certain kinds of birds that they saw, and you could just call it generally go from that. And now, of course, they found, uh, uh, supposedly, Viking remains down in Rhode Island. They suddenly have found a piece of coal that is mined in uh, Rhode Island up in Greenland, so it shows that some Vikings uh, have come back and forth this far south. Mm -hmm. But I think pretty much that Leaf must have been up there and just in Newfoundland, and as these men leave uh, these days. There is one interesting point that you make uh, about the Vikings in Greenland, where Eric the Red built his house over a spring, so they had inside water. That's right. And this that, is a historical that, that, fact. That's mm -hmm. actually true. I base that on actual fact. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's two, three houses like that up in Greenland that they have dug up where they did that. Mm -hmm. The, the thing pioneers in Kentucky, they often didn't do it. They didn't mess with it. They said, oh, we can fight anybody and we, our spring's a hundred yards away. We can get to it and back all the time. Our elk will send the women. We don't mind the women going down there and getting <laughs> shot. You know, <laughs> let them get the water. But, uh, one fort, Logan's fort really did have a spring in one corner of it. And I think, uh, Harris, but finally, they finally enclosed that spring too. Uh, the pioneers were smart too, but the Vikings were plenty smart. If they could find a spring, they, they incorporated in that house right away. <laughs> <laughs> Are you planning a new book? Well, I just turned in one two months ago. It'll be out in uh, the fall of 1968 called The Old Wilderness Road, two dots there, colon, uh, an American uh, journey in which I take up the Wilderness Road, what everybody says is Daniel Boone's old road, but which I believe was invented by four different men and put together by four different men. And this is the road to Kentucky, and this is the road our pioneers went over to help make Kentucky the 15th state, the first west of the Appalachian Mountains. From then on, Kentucky was no longer the backwoods, but when Kentucky became a state, it was the frontier, and from then our American ancestors pushed across west towards the Pacific Ocean. And I'm showing how the Wilderness Road and these four men helped move the America along from being British to being purely American, dropping our past and taking up a whole new uh, cultural traits and whatnot. This will be uh, one we'll be looking forward to. It's nonfiction. Are you planning any new uh, tall tales? No, I wish I had an idea about a tall tale book because I like to do tall tales. They're more fun to write than the other books, and uh, I would really love to do a tall tale book now. I'm, I'm right for one, but I just can't get an idea. You've got to have an idea to start with. You can't just throw out a bunch of tall tales. Now, I know a bunch of tall tales I can throw out, but you've got to string them on some kind of little form and have some kind of little idea behind it, and I haven't got that yet, but I think I'll wait towards it in the next couple of years. I have several commitments first I got to get off. Uh, uh, God, state of Tennessee, my wife and I are going to do one together for a change. We've never done one together. 
my wife Wilson Gage, and we're going to do this book on uh, uh, a sort of a modern day guide of Tennessee, just a light little once over lightly thing. And I have a book to write about Indians in 1644 in Virginia, which they almost throughout the Virginian colonies, and then I will settle down to a tall tale, I think. <laughs> well, we hope you get an inspiration for a tall tale. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Steele, it's been very nice talking with well, you. Well, I've enjoyed it. And you've given us some wonderful answers. Well, I don't know if that's true or not, but anyway, I try. Oh, um, it has been uh, lots and lots of fun. Oh, and we thank you. Thank you, ma'am.